the idea is to touch people's hearts. And, you know, I'm not really a preacher, so I can't do that um, through a sermon, but I can do it through music. And that is really the goal here is to, in some way, touch people's lives in a very positive way. And hopefully we've managed to do that with this music. This train is a clean train, this train. This train is a clean train, this train. This train is a clean train, everybody riding in Jesus' name. This train is a clean train, this train. Yeah, that's the that's the question I've been getting most is why why did I choose to do this project now and why this this kind of project and I had to ask myself that question too. It's like why do I want to do this? Um, at the top of the year, we decided, well, I decided that I wasn't going to do anything. And I had said that I wasn't going to do a project at all, and then um, Daniel Beard calls me up and says, hey, man, uh, how about doing this blues record? And I said, man, you know, that sounds good. And I thought about it. And, yeah, so that started it. And then had started having conversations with you about doing something different. And it just evolved into a gospel project. And then the thing became, well, how if we do a gospel project, how do we make it different from everything else that we've done? So going that traditional route, that was the thing that was to me, the most attractive in making it different than what anybody else was doing. The thing that attracts me to Eric's music is uh, just the soul that he puts into to what he plays. He and Kelvin both are just such soulful guys. And so we had talked about doing a, a blues record for a while, and I'd been trying to talk him into doing that. And so we discussed making it a gospel record with a blues feel. So it was cool for me to, to kind of help him um, come up with that sound, create the vibe for the record. Ian Kelvin and I worked on demos, and so we were able to uh, decide on the direction of the project, and now uh, we're getting to execute that. So I'm really excited about uh, the direction it's going. The tracks that we've cut so far are really cool, and uh, I think it's really gonna turn out good. I remember the, te the text message that I sent out, you know, and uh, I remember the responses from both of y'all when I said, you know, how about a traditional gospel project? It was like, you know, all caps on everything. <laughs> all caps and a bunch of exclamation points. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we were all in agreement from the very beginning that this is what we needed to do. I decided to go to Fame Studios because when we initially started talking about the project and Kelvin brought up this amazing point that if we're going to do Alabama artists, we're going to focus on Alabama artists and we're going to do this type of music, then it just makes sense for us to do it at a legendary studio in Alabama. So we needed that connection and Fame was just, it was the logical. It was a logical thing to do. Fame um, Studios, it's just one of those spots. You know, if you 
if you drive up on the sound, this is where it all started. And really, truly, it is where it all kind of started for North Alabama music. Um, and just to be in a place where such other great musicians and recording artists have, you know, they've done their work. Just, and you can feel that energy in the room. I almost play like a different musician than I do, than I would play if I was playing at home on my own stuff. Kind of hard to explain unless you're here doing it. But I would always, you know, I mean, if I had my way, this would be the place to record. Man, recording here at Fame. First of all, I'm glad to be here. This is um, when he told me we were going to be tracking in Muscle Shoals and doing it at Fame. <laughs> I was like, what? Um, and walking in the studio, there's a sign in there that says, um, the world's greatest songwriters, producers, and artists and musicians have come enter, enter into this room. I believe that's paraphrasing what it says. And to, um, to go into that very room um, is, is pretty amazing. And to be in the room that a lot of the greats have recorded, um, it's an honor. And it's kind of, it's a milestone for me. You know, uh, there's a lot of history with Muscle Shoals and music, a lot of history. And I'm glad to walk in those steps and be in the room and using some of the same gear that my heroes used. Fame has that vibe that we had on the uh, 2000 Southbound album that you just cannot get anywhere else. Hands down. You know, I listen, I see other people talk about other studios like Electric Lady in New, in New York and Hit Factory and, you know, um, studios in Memphis where people record and they say the same things like you can't get that energy and it's just something about that particular spot and Fame is like that. I truly believe that some places in the world have a certain kind of energy that cannot be explained. It just is what it is. And, you know, we played at shows for 20-something years. Every summer we go up there and do the WC Handy Festival. And I know that there have been moments that we've been on stage that something else has just taken over, the whole band, you know. And we're playing at a level that's so high that, for us, that you know, it's, we just can't explain it. And it's the people, it's a combination of the people, I think the energy in the area, and, and fame just happens to be sitting right in the center of all of that. And, and so it just, uh, it just becomes a part of, of whatever you do musically. And so it was just a natural thing for us to, to go there to do this record. Uh, yeah, I met Eric um, when I was 18 years old. I've actually been playing with him for a long time. We, uh, I was actually in my first band with Eric, a band called Souvenir. We both are, you know, natives of Birmingham, Alabama. So all these years later, we're still doing it. So pretty easy because Kelvin and Eric are my best friends in the world. Those are my two best friends. I mean, it's just like a walk in the park. I mean, we've been playing together for so long. Yeah, I mean, we have a good time. I mean, there's been some times where we disagreed about some stuff and, you know, you, you go through stuff that friends go through. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, the friendship always outshines anything else that could have come up. Sitting on ready. <laughs> Unless somebody else need to go first. <laughs> that was funny. I'm sitting over here. Unless somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need, I need to mark some spots. Excellent. 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 Mark it down. 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 Don't break it down. Mark it down. <laughs> mark it down. KC and Jojo. <laughs> Daniel 
Angel Beard was on that first session as a young, you know, my engineer. And he was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> he would probably tell you now, you know, that that's an understatement. I could, I could tell he was really nervous. But the thing about it is, he was amazing. Um, and the way he captured everything, the vibe of the session, got everything pretty much perfect, you know, and capturing the, the, mu the actual music. So he's worked on, I don't know, I guess about maybe six, seven, eight projects since then, and just become a part of the family and a part of the musical conversation. And he, he shapes, along with Kelvin and, and myself, you know, what, that, what the music winds up being. He's part of the conversation. When we mix a record and he's mixing it, he's, he's bringing his own uh, level of creativity into the process. And so it was a natural progression for him also to be a part of, of, of this record as well. I began working at Fame Studios uh, while I was still in school at UNA. And um, so once I graduated from UNA, I uh, started working here full time. I was here for about 10 years and learned everything that I know about the music business here. I got to work closely with Rick Hall uh, in the studio, just sitting by his side, learning uh, a lot of techniques and learning what uh, soul really is and how to record that and capture it and create that. So uh, when I got to work with uh, Eric here first on his record, um, that was, as I said, the, the beginning uh, of my relationship with him. And so to kind of come full circle, to be able to come back here to work with him uh, on his record and as well to be at Fame uh, again, just kind of, I feel like I'm back home. Daniel's actually been trying to Move, and he, I will say this, Daniel has moved me from a place where there is a lot of, um, uh, the music is ornamented, you know, there are all these bells and whistles going on in the production to a very, um, like you use the word, minimalist approach to the music. He's moved, he's moved me from where I was to where I am now, and I'm comfortable here now. Um, we've talked about that kind of production, we've talked about that kind of stuff over the years, and here we are. You know, it's a very, very raw sounding project, but it still sounds full. Kelvin and I have been working together on projects since 2000, the Southbound album, and it's, it's been amazing to see the transition from just playing playing music, reading charts, and interpreting music to being an active participant in shaping the music conceptually, you know, and as a producer, that input, you know. And it started from the very, for, very first session, you know. It was obvious that um, his contribution to the music was more than just playing the parts that were written. It was... Um, uh, a call and response uh, thing that I noticed immediately between whoever's doing the melody on the song, which would generally be me, and and him, you know, making a, a direct response to whatever was said, you know, in the melody. That was the first thing I noticed, which made me think, man, this dude is listening. You know, he's paying attention. He's paying attention. He's contributing not only the part, but to the whole of the song, the whole of the album.
this this album has more this album has more musicians on it than anything I've ever done by far. I think it's a total of 18 people actually participating in making the music. We um, had a four basically a four piece band that did all of the foundation for the record. So we had Kelvin Wooten on keyboards, um, and I, I should be more specific when I say keyboards, organ, piano, and uh, Wurlitzer, and glockenspiel. <laughs> gotta have glockenspiel, just like cowbell. You, gotta, you just gotta have more of it. Shawn Michael Ray's on bass, Marcus Finney on drums. Then when we look at the, the, the guest artists on the record, we got Kirk Whalum on saxophone, Ruben Studdard, American Idol winner, singing on the blood. Kevin Whalum is on the record. Amazing rendition of uh, On My Way to Canaan Land. When we go to the Alabama artists, we've got legendary gospel artists, pop artist Candy Staten, R&B singer who's on the record, and that was a real, you know, big moment for me. She was the first, one of the first people I ever met in the industry that was, you know, at the top of the industry, and so to have her be a part of this project was, I can't even really explain how, how awesome that was for me. George Peoples, who is an artist that we worked with before, and she came in and just just knocked everything out in like two takes. Really, the first take was okay. First take was perfect. We just did one just for you know just for grins. Just, just to say we got all this time. So like, yeah, I got I got all this. Time. Yeah, and for you to come in here in three minutes and knock it out. <laughs> yeah, we need we need to do just a little bit more. One of the, one of my favorite artists. Um, that I worked with on this, this album was Kalia Wooten, who's been on my last four, this will be the fourth project in a row that Kalia's been on. Uh, Eric Essex, the self-titled album in 2012. She was on the Evolution album. She was on the Ozzy Brothers project. Um, so just watching her evolve as a young artist and the level of professionalism. I mean, she comes in into the studio like a pro, you know. She's just got that, she's already got that. It's just inherent, and, and it's just who she is. It's amazing, the patience, the focus, you know. It's just, it's unbelievable that somebody that age, at that age, you know, who doesn't really have like a huge track record, like some of the people that we work with, can come in at that level, you know. So it's just amazing, you know. The sky's the limit for her. You know, what she, whatever she chooses to do. Sunlight's on the record because I, I personally have a um, connection to quartet music as a singer, you know, singing in those kinds of groups, a cappella groups from back in the day when I was younger. So to have the sunlights on that on this record just kind of harkens back to that, you know, Dixie Hummingbirds, uh, Mighty Clouds of Joy kind of stuff that I listened to and, and sung when I was coming up. The recording that y'all did. So, well, back then, you know, we had to 
Yeah, what well, now? We had that hip of the house. No, <laughs> we, no, we, we that translation. You. <laughs> yeah, I just want, I want to, oh, Jesus, Jesus gave me water. Oh, That's okay. the one, yeah. yeah. But that Jesus gave me water, I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is good. All week this yeah. week. <laughs> yeah. So we'll do that one first. And, um, you know, in, the, in I'm thinking about when we when we actually get the, the final thing done, it's in that whole Dixie Hummingbirds kind of, mm -hmm. you know, we had one guitar player and mm -hmm. six singers, you know. So trying to recreate that kind of vibe. Okay. Yeah. The most, probably the most important appearance on the record for me is the Quilters of G's Ben. And I say that because what they did for the record, you know, and we, we, did, we didn't even know that this was going to happen when we were d doing this, is they really connected the entire record to the roots of gospel for me. You know, and they only did two interludes and one full song that I played along with them on. But it's those moments sprinkled throughout the album that just, you know, when it, when it feels like it, it's, it's here, um, you know, at the level of spirituality and, and uh, emotion, they Holy just, Holy Ghost is so funny. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you feel like you can't get enough Holy Ghost. They just let you have a little bit more and, and just connect everything to the root, the source of gospel with the way they sing and the, with the passion that they sing you know, with the emotion that they bring to, to every song that they sing. Yeah. 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 Together. Trying to myself, ooh, as far as back I can remember. Cause we you saying at the same church or uh, we at different churches now. Mm -hmm. So we used to sing the choir together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh trying to myself for uh just she and I since 2010. Ooh, wow. Or longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they used to be five or saying together. But uh three of the ladies uh, you know, they kinda got up were well, asked they got up in age. Mm -hmm. And one of them had a stroke and, and it affected her memory. And then one was having, uh, you know, had a stent put in and she was having trouble getting around. And then the other one had a problem with her leg. Good. So when it got to the point, nobody was trying to myself. So you call, you consider this gospel music, right? Yeah, it is. It's gospel. That's all, that's what we, you know, we were born and raised. Mm -hmm. We came up and uh, learned how to sing mm -hmm. at the church. And ever since then, God has been blessing us. They keep on traveling, so when people call and ask about coming, and they say, we want some ladies that sing. And so most of the time, since I feel that China not sound good to go, so China not want to get to go. That's all you need. That's right. <laughs> Um, 
First of all, my mom was my biggest cheerleader in the sense that whatever I did musically, she supported it, you know. Um, and I did a record for, for a label that Ben Tanker um, was the uh, owner of back in 19, I guess it was 1994. That music is all, you know, it has a real kind of, um, uh, it has a real spiritual vibe to it. And my mom, I would walk in her place of business. She owned an optical, retail optical store. I could walk in there any given time right. and that record would be playing, you know. And she was like, you need to do something for the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you need to do something for the Lord. You need to tithe with it out. Yeah, yeah, you need to tithe with it Yeah. Two three albums, yeah. you need to, you yeah. know. A tenth, you know. You need to give a tenth day, just do one. I mean, and that's literally almost exactly what she was saying, you know, is all this other, all the other things that you're doing, you need to give some of that gift and some of that talent back to the Lord in a way. And, and, and the essence, that was the essence of what she was saying. with me album back in 2005 that was um, right after my mother passed and I felt so bad after she passed that I never got to do that record that she always wanted me to do and so I immediately went into the studio I mean almost like a couple three days after she passed started focusing on doing that record and it was it was a great thing to do because it helped me to divert my attention away from the fact that she had passed and that she had asked me to do this. And it, it allowed me to focus on that and and um, just really get it done quickly. Because I did most of that myself. And, you know, you were um, a vital part of getting it done, PJ Spragans. Uh, it was really the first record that we did in the kind of a trio kind of setting where it's just me, you, and a drummer. Um, so yeah, and we had some special guests, a couple special guest artists on that record as well. But um, yeah, that was the first uh, gospel-oriented album that I did before this trip. So, you know, when I go back, and, I, and, and for anybody who, who may think that this record, this train is, um, you know, a real pivot or a real shift in another direction for me, if you go back and look at the catalog and you look at the records that I've done over the past 20 plus years, there's always something there that reveals the fact that, you know, I wanted to make this particular record now. You know, it's there's always some some gospel or spiritual or inspirational music everywhere. computer be sure and listen to what it's doing to the music wow because we're here to serve the music what yeah you know, we're oh. here to try to make the music mm. connect better with the listener emotionally man it's an emotionally experienced music mm -hmm. and if you if you destroy that and it becomes a machine or mechanical and mm -hmm. low metallic and mm -hmm. less natural and less human mm -hmm. you, you're not going to communicate man. your ideas and what you're trying to get across to the listeners right or it's right. going to be harder for them to enter into your world of your your portrayal of your experiences of, of the human because it's a, just a you know it's like a portrayal of the human experience from your point of view right mm -hmm. right you know and it enriches everyone else if we get it yeah because it's never exactly ours right and so it's it's good to be able to get this bigger view of 
each every each and every emotion that we all have. Mm -hmm. You all have the same emotions, but but you have a different way of expressing it. And I, I might have a different way, or if you're, and especially if you're a musician, that's what you're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It's the person that kind of plans it out mm -hmm. that is the improviser. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of done ahead of time, but it's, yeah. still, it's, similar, it's, still, right. it's a similar thing. Right. Right. It's a similar thing yeah. because you're, you're you're trying to take people on an emotional journey. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, and you want to take them, you want to lift them out of their seats and take them somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So, that's the object. You know, we want to do that. Yeah. We want to create this environment. Right. Is what it was. I think it's a, a good way to look at it. You know, so it's really different from where they are. Mm -hmm. there, but you can enter into this right. magic world. We hope. <laughs> That's the goal, anyway. <laughs> it's is to touch people's hearts and you know I'm not really a preacher so I can't do that um, through a sermon but I can do it through music and that is really the goal here is to in some way touch people's lives in a very positive way and hopefully we've managed to do that with this music. Go. Oh. 